Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Being alone with nobody but God for a season in your life is the single best thing that can ever happen to you. Because when you don't have anybody else, you get to know God pretty good. Jesus said in Matthew 22, 36, when he was asked, what's the most important commandment? He said, here's the first one. Talking about the law of first things. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. <laughs> what's that saying other than make sure that you put God first in everything? Our God is a consuming fire. When you are leaning excessively on something else or someone else, when something or someone means more to you than what it should, God may be obligated to remove that thing from your life. You see, God is jealous of things that you lean on when you should be leaning on Him. When you have a problem, He doesn't want you to run to the phone. He wants you to go to the throne. Why in the world do we spend hours on the phone asking everybody we know what we should do when they don't even know what they're doing? Go to God first, and then if He puts it on your heart to talk to a friend or a spiritual leader, now you've heard from God to do it. You're not just going in desperation trying to get people I'm not saying God doesn't use people. He speaks through people. I believe some of you have heard exactly what you need to hear from God through my mouth this weekend. But I believe it's because you have been seeking God that He would speak to you. Isaiah 2, 22. Cease to trust in weak, frail, and dying man <laughs> whose breath is in his nostrils <laughs> for so short a time. In what sense can he be counted as having any intrinsic worth? Question mark. Chapter 3, verse 1. <laughs> I love it. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, is taking away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay and the staff, which I would not have known what that was, but look what it is. Every kind of prop. <laughs> What's got you propped up? <laughs> you know, I'll just talk about one instance in my life, but there could be many. As a young Christian, I was very insecure, and God called me into ministry, and I was still very insecure. And because I grew up being abused, I never had any real God-ordained worth and value. So, like many people do, I was trying to feel like I had worth and value through what I did, through my position, through the people I knew. And so I taught a home Bible study for five years, and then... I went to work at a church in St. Louis, and it was a growing church. It was in the, the heat of the charismatic outpouring in the early 80s, and we just had a wonderful time, and God blessed me there, and I was one of the pastors on staff. I taught in the Bible college, and I had a weekly meeting that hosted at that time about 400 ladies, which was very huge for a weekly ladies' meeting, and I had a parking place with my name on it. I had a seat with my name on it, and I had an office with my name on it. Don't we love to see our name on something? <laughs> and I felt important. People came to me. They needed me. You see, I was important. And God said to me, After working there five years, as I pulled into the driveway one day, he said, I'm finished with you here now. <laughs> you know, you're in bad shape when God gets finished and you're not. <laughs> Come on. And that's where a lot of our agony comes from. God's done with it, and you've been pushing a dead horse up a hill. <laughs> Come on, if the horse has been dead 10 years, dismount.
Well, I stayed for a year after God told me to leave, and I can honestly say that was one of the most confusing, most miserable years of my life. And I won't go into all the details of that, but the odd thing was, was there was a part of me that couldn't give it up, and there was a part of me that had wanted to leave a long time before God told me to go. Because I knew I had another call on my life. I knew in my spirit that I had a very strong teaching gift and that perhaps God could use me to speak to people all over the world. I had a desire to write books. I had a desire for media ministry. I don't even know where I got these desires. Well, I do know God put them in me. But if I would have stayed where I was safe and comfortable and felt important, <laughs> then I wouldn't be here today. And we wouldn't have all these mission works all over the world. And I wouldn't have the opportunity to be on television in 38 languages because I was working in another man's ministry, and rightfully so, that was the vision God had given him, and I needed to come under that and support that. But here I had this other thing that God had put in me. <laughs> and I'm sure that if he were here today, he would tell you this too, and I know he wouldn't mind me saying it. He also did not know how to release me. And so it was just a nightmare for me. I didn't want to hurt and disappoint them. I didn't want to leave what I had because I didn't know what I was going to. You know, you're in bad shape when God's telling you to let go of what you got, but he won't show you what you're going to get. <laughs> Come on now. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Woo. And you're out there somewhere stuck in the middle going, ah. Well, you see, here's the thing. I did not know how insecure that I was and how much I depended on those things that had me propped up. You see, that job was a prop. That attention that I got was a prop. That parking place with my name on it was a prop. God wanted me to put no confidence in anything other than him. And if I needed to, to be able to walk away from anything and stand totally alone... And say, I will be a God pleaser or I will be nothing. I want to be well thought of, but I can do without it if I have to. If you have to sit out there in church and be jealous of the worship leader coveting her job, You need to know who you are in Christ, and you need to know if God wanted you to have that position, no man and no devil in hell could keep you from it. Stop trying to promote yourself and let God do it, because the worst thing you can do is put yourself somewhere and then have the agony of trying to keep yourself there. There's no harder work than trying to keep people impressed. So when God told me to leave that place, and of course my husband knew all this long time before I ever did. <laughs> he kept telling me, you need to leave, you need to leave, you need to leave. God's called you, so, oh. <laughs> and uh, so for God, finally, you know, I just got so miserable. I was like, God, what in the world is going on? He said, I told you to leave and you're still here. Well, it was the single, one of the hardest things I've ever done. It wasn't the only hard thing, but it was one of the hardest things I've ever done to walk away from that job. And I left with a dented desk and a calculator. <laughs> Didn't know where I was going, what I was going to do. God said, take your ministry, go north, south, east, and west. Well, the only problem was nobody knew me except in my little town. So I went to north St. Louis, east St. Louis, west St. Louis, and south St. Louis. <laughs> I did. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> once a month I had a meeting in North County once a month I had a meeting in South County I had a meeting in the East and I had a meeting in the West and we went on eight radio stations one here in Arizona was one of the ones of those first eight radio stations that we went on <laughs> and 
As our ministry began to grow a little bit and I was going through all that stuff, believing God for mail and a few people to come to the meetings. <laughs> I learned how much other things had me propped up. and God removed those. He will kick that stuff out from under you. Sometimes it comes almost violently if you won't listen. <laughs> and you, I don't understand, God. I just feel like you, you gave me this and now I have nothing. God is not going to let you have secondhand faith. You got to have your own walk with God. You got to have your own relationship with God. You don't need to call one of your spiritual friends every time you don't know where a scripture's at. Find it. Come on. You shouldn't live in the prayer line. Hopefully someday you can start doing the praying. Being alone with nobody but God for a season in your life is the single best thing that can ever happen to you. Because when you don't have anybody else, you get to know God pretty good. Oh, yeah. So, anyway. God's going to get rid of those props in our life. And He's going to make us so dependent on Him that literally it's like we're addicted to Jesus. And we are going to be addicted to that time that we need with Him because we have finally gotten mature enough to know that if we are not rooted and grounded in Him, when do you remove the props off of a baby tree? When it's got roots deep enough to hold it steady in any storm. And the Bible says we are to be rooted and grounded in God, rooted and grounded in His love. When you know God, then you can say like Job, I know that my Redeemer lives. Yeah. What a statement. In the mess he was in, I know that my Redeemer lives. There are promises made in the Bible that are made to those who personally know him. Paul said, I am determined to know him. And the power of his resurrection. Psalm 90, 114 is so beautiful. God delivers all those who know him personally. I want to tell you something. Satan gets frantic and mean when there's any indication that we might spend enough time with God to actually get to know him personally. And have an intimate relationship with him. He'd rather you go to church. And I'm certainly not saying don't go to church. But I'm just telling you. The devil will fight you harder on your personal time with God. Even than he will trying to keep you out of church. And we all know how hard he works on that. Let me share something with you that I think is a great lesson. Jeannie Guyon is a woman that lived in the 1600s. And. I've read a lot of her stuff. It was very, very, very helpful to me. You might not agree with all of it, but I've learned to eat the good stuff and spit out the bad stuff and realize that Revelation is progressive. And, you know, in some ways she knew more than we know today, but then in other ways maybe there's some things that God has revealed that she didn't quite have a handle on yet. But I got from her what I needed which was this understanding that our Father who art in heaven also sent His Spirit to dwell in me <laughs> and in you. And we have to have a real understanding of God in us, Christ in us, the mystery of the ages. Nobody was teaching this in the 1600s. She was a devoted Catholic at the age of 16. She entered an arranged marriage with a man much older than herself, which was common then. Her mother-in-law persecuted her continuously until it caused so much emotional stress and depression for her that she couldn't hardly stand it. As a result of that, 
And I love this. You know, it seems like sometimes when you're at your worst, that's when you finally meet God. She finally had a major encounter with God and discovered that she could know him personally. That he lived in her and that she could pray from her heart rather than reading out of prayer books that other people had written. Which was all they had then. Prayers were said out loud out of books. Well, I'm not saying that they didn't mean anything to anybody, but I can tell you the truth. If you go to church and just read stuff out of other books, and, you know, I, I'm, this is not about any denomination. I'm not trying to slam anything, but, I mean, you know, you can stand up and sit down and read this and read that, and, you know, maybe you're one of the few that can keep your mind on it. It can really mean something to you, but I think sometimes even if you're saying the same thing over and over every week, it just kind of gets to be like, hmm. So if that is the way that your church handles worship, make certain that you stay hooked in and that you really pay attention to what you're saying and that it means something to you. Because God doesn't want to hear our mouth if our heart's not connected to it. Come on. But all they were allowed then was to... They said prayers at specific times and they said them out of books. Well, she started talking to God herself silently in her heart and obviously there was something happening in her life that other people wanted to know about so they began to ask her she discovered that sanctification and holiness were the result of faith rather than our own works and effort that is another thing the devil does not want you to know he doesn't want you to be saved but if you're going to he wants you to work yourself to death trying to be a good Christian he wants you to be so worn out and frustrated that even though you're going to go to heaven, you never enjoy one day of your journey. Because you're too frustrated trying to be a good Christian. <laughs> Come on, is anybody awake out there today? Well, as she began to teach these things to people one-on-one -on -one, just in conversation, the word about her doctrine spread. So she began to write things down for the benefit of individuals who throw no, and through no effort of her own, they were put into books and widely distributed. One of which I read 20 years ago that I could venture to say saved my Christian life. Her biographer said that church instigated harassment and persecution escalated. Her window sashes were broken, her mail intercepted, all which caused her to have to move from city to city where her upstanding and credible reputation was still spreading among the lay people. Dave always says if you're walking with God and the devil tries to squelch you, it's like stepping on mercury. The more you step on it, the more it spreads in every direction. <laughs> from far and wide, friars, priests, Men of the world, maids, wives, widows, all came to her one after another to hear what she was saying. <laughs> the interest in her teachings was so great that often she was occupied from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. speaking of God. Clerics were grieved deeply. That means the religious people of the day were deeply grieved that a woman was so sought after. Thank you, Jesus. I mean, it would have been hard for him if it would have been a man, but a woman. <laughs> now, here's what happened. She was in prison for trying to teach people that they could pray from their heart and from trying to teach people that they could only change and be saved by faith, not by works and effort. They put her in prison. She spent a lot of years in an austere convent. Then she was under arrest where she stayed in a room in a castle. She was under house arrest and finally spent four years in the Bastille, which was a prison known for its absolutely unbelievably horrible conditions. This broke her health and she died at the age of 56. But she's still helping people today. Amen. I learned from dead Christians. Wow. 
what I wasn't finding out from any of them that were alive. Her physical world was small. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. And don't ever discount what God is using you for. That woman had no idea at all how she would influence people three and four hundred years later. I doubt when she was in that Bastille if she had any idea that the things that she had written would survive and that I'm just one case there are many others but that someday a woman who was influenced by her work would be speaking to two-thirds of the world in 38 languages by television and radio her work goes on and you know what we're all gonna die but I tell you what, I'm determined to leave a legacy. I'm going to leave something. And if the world survives another four or five hundred years, which we all kind of doubt that it will, but if it does, I want somebody to be standing in a pulpit somewhere saying, I read that stuff from a lady called Joyce Meyer that's been dead 500 years. Even if the world can manage to shut you up, your voice will go on and on and on and on. Woo. You have to understand that Satan will fight like a mad animal to keep you from ever getting to know God personally. I implore you, no matter what else you do, don't have a love affair with the world and break your marriage vow to God. Start praying about this. Start seeking God on a regular basis. I mean day after day after day. And you know what? Don't ask yourself if you feel His presence, if you got anything out of it. You got to get beyond all that. I, you know, I don't, I don't have time to get into that stuff anymore. <laughs> Did you feel God? I don't have to depend on that prop of feelings because I know. Come on, I know that He is with me all the time. I don't even, you know, I, we get into these things. Oh God, I just need to hear from you. It's been so long I've heard from you. And God tells me every time I start that, you hear from me all the time. <laughs> you know, here's what happens to us. When we're not used to being led by the Spirit, it's like a big emotional, wow, woo -hoo. I tell you, the only thing that happens when you've been walking with God 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, you get used to it. We need to live amazed. Amazed. I am amazed that I am going to be 66 years old in about three months and I feel like I'm 25. I'm amazed at God. And I know that it's not natural and I know that it's not normal. It's God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and they shall not faint. Get tired, quit, and give up. When you go spend time with God, if you can't think of anything to say, sit there. You get points for being there. If you don't hear anything then, maybe three days later, you'll put your hand on the refrigerator door and hear something from God. <laughs> like, you don't need to eat that. Well, let's have a moment of truth. You know, if we're too busy to spend regular time seeking God, 
then I think we're really just too busy with a lot of things that really probably don't make that much difference because we should always manage our lives in such a way that we have good quality time for God. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 4 that physical training is of some value, but godliness is useful and valuable in everything and in every way.